Hi, everyone. Welcome to Staging DBT Demo Day, August uh, 12th edition. We're excited to have you with us today. My name is Drew Bannon. I'm one of the co-founders here at DBT Labs. I run the product team and you can find me on the DBT Slack at drew.bannon. I want to share something with you all. We actually intended for this week to be our product and design group team offsite here in Philadelphia. But due to uh, the circumstances around coronavirus, we actually canceled those. So we, we did pick a theme, which is about teamwork and collaboration for this year's staging. And, and yet we're actually all calling in from our own homes, but we're going to roll with the theme. And uh, for this one, it's team together. Everyone achieves models, which is what you thought it was going to quick run a show. We're going to go through this whole presentation hear from a couple of folks over the course of the next hour and towards the end. We're going to jump into two different breakout rooms. So if you want to hear more about DAGs and metadata and lineage, you can join Bar and I. If you want to hear more about workflows and jobs as code, you can join Julia and Jeremy, and you can see the kind of relevant DBT Slack channels in there to grab the Zoom link and participate in the chat. Um, so excited to be speaking with you later today. So this is the, the product team here at DBT Labs. You'll hear from each of us over the course of today's event. And at a high level, we're going to be recapping what's happened here so far. And I'm going to show off a bit of a product demo. You'll hear from Jeremy on what's happening in DBT core, Bar around metadata, Julia around environment variables, and then we'll jump into these breakout rooms. So it is August. This year has both been slow and very fast in a way that I'm sure you can understand. And in case you missed it, I wanted to call it a, a couple of highlights from, from the past few months, uh, since you might've heard from us last. So we're called DBT labs. Now you might've formerly known us as Fishtown Analytics, but, but DBT Labs, still lowercase, that's important. We informally called ourselves townies back when we were called Fishtown Analytics. So put your suggestions in the chat in Slack, what should we call ourselves now that we're in DBT Labs? My vote is for lab rats, but nobody likes that one. We raised a series C over the past uh, quarter. Also, if you want to put in the chat, what should we spend the money on? Uh, we think maybe a research and development and, and go to market, but maybe you think avocado toast. Tell us what you think. And finally, uh, not finally, penultimately, we are doing the, the second iteration of Coalesce in December, 2021. If you haven't already, you should register at coalesce.getdpt.com. It was a fantastic event last year. You're going to hear from some amazing speakers, including Tristan and me and some other members of, of our team and a whole lot of experts. The last thing I just wanted to drop in case you missed it is at the start of this year, we really did want to undertake a significant amount of work make DBT just way faster at parsing projects than at the tail end of last year. And Jeremy's going to dig into this later, but in terms of highlights, we really did want to call out at the highest level. DBT today is 97% faster at parsing projects than it was at the start of the year. That's exciting. Wanted to make sure we celebrated it as a community here. So changing gears, want to talk about this idea of collaboration. I'm sure many of you are familiar with how DBT can help bridge these integration points between different people working in an organization, working in an organization aligned around data. So one of the things that we're seeing and hearing from people that we talk to is that DBT projects are getting bigger. There are more people collaborating on these projects and it can be hard to understand how the models in a project can relate to each other. So throughout this conversation, we've been learning a lot about how people structure their DBT projects. And we've published a lot of writing about how we do it here. You can see the file tree for our, our GitHub issue and pull request data in our DBT project on the left. So everyone's thinking about file trees here. But I'm wondering why we aren't talking about lineage graphs. We think lineage graphs are, are a really great way of helping people internalize the shape of a DBT project and how things relate to each other. So this is one you might've seen from the DBT documentation website. It's showing a, a, a source uh, table in green and how it flows through some different models with a given selector. We think this is a really intuitive way to explore and understand the shape of a DBT project, whether you're jumping into it for the first time or refactoring some code that you yourself might've written. Uh, maybe a long time ago. So with that framing, want to jump into a bit of a demo and maybe it's just my screen that's not updating. So let's tab over to the DBT cloud IDE. Maybe some of you have seen this before and here's the same kind of file tree that we were looking at moments ago. One of the things I want to show you is so if you're taking a look at, here's a staging model around GitHub issues. We're pulling this data and using five track. We use some of this data to understand like community contributions and, and how many issues are open and they're being triaged and how long it takes and things like that. So this is the big new thing I want to show off. There's now a lineage tab that should be available in all DBT cloud accounts in the multi-tenant uh, environment as of this morning. So if you click over to the lineage tab, you should catch a DAG visualization of your DBT project. And the really cool thing about this is it's deeply integrated into the IDE. 
So if I'm going to click around and say, oh, I was looking at this staging model, but really I, I probably want to create from this back model. You can just double click on that and catch both the code that powers this model, as well as the updated lineage to this spec model. So that's great, but you can see like, it's a little bit of a constrained environment down here in this drawer. So what we can do is actually expand out this tab and kind of get the, the full picture view of the DAG. And, and this is great because it actually supports arbitrary DBT selectors. So say I want to select from Fivetran GitHub, the source, this is going to show us all of our source models, but really what I want is all their descendants. So. These are all the models um, that kind of participate in selecting from. So we're really excited about uh, launching this out in the world. We had a bunch of folks participate in more of an open beta. So if you did and you gave us feedback, thanks so much. We really incorporated it and we were uh, pleased to hear what you thought about this kind of throughout. We're also just really excited because we know that DAGVIS is a really powerful part of the DBT experience. And we think we're going to make it a lot more uh, intuitive and baked into the DBT development workflow with these changes. So lots more to say about this, but looking at the clock, I want to make sure that we take it back to the big picture. It's like, why do we build this? So we're building an IDE. The I is for integrated, right? We want to take the entire context of a DBT project and put it right at your fingertips in development. This manifests as a sort of simplified Git flow and ideally a deep integration with the latest and greatest feature sets in DBT. For a long time, it really felt like this DAG was, was lacking because it's so central to the DBT experience, but it was nowhere to be found within the IDE itself. So we're really excited about this and what it means for kind of the future of DBT development and the IDE. We want to do a lot more like this in the future. And just in general, as we're thinking about what we want the IDE to, to, to be in, in the future and, and focusing our, our energy on improving the IDE continually, this is really going to manifest as big strides in performance and reliability through the end of the year. Some of you have written into us with kind of commentary about that, and, and we're taking it seriously and making the investments we need to make to achieve the level of performance and reliability that we're looking for. And then on top of that kind of stable foundation of performance and reliability, we'll be delivering these kind of more integrated differentiating features that make the IDE a great place to, to write DBT code. So thanks again to everyone who participated in the beta or gave us feedback. If you weren't a part of the beta, we do still want to hear from you. We'll definitely be doing more betas. I'll keep an eye out in the DBT Slack for information about those. And if you have feedback about DBT Cloud, the new DAGVIS, if you play around with it or anything else, we do want to hear your feedback every time. Keep it coming. With that, I'm going to pass things over to Jeremy. Uh, he's going to talk to us a little bit about DBT Core. Thanks, Drew. As always, a great kickoff. Great way to set the tone. As Drew hinted at the very beginning, I've got something very exciting to share that we're going to build up to. The first thing I want to talk about is core performance. This won't be the first time. If you've been to our staging demo days before or seen our release notes, uh, things I've said in Slack, this has been a huge focus of ours in 2021. So I want to do a quick check in on the progress we've made thus far. Background here, on January 1st of this year, there existed DBT projects that took eight minutes to start up. That is an involuntary extended coffee break. Every single time you want to run a model, test some tests, snapshots, whatever the case may be. And that's especially painful in development when you're trying to do really quick iterative development on say one model, just run one model, run the tests on that model. So that's way too slow unconscionably slow. And our goal this year has been to make sure that all projects start up in less than five seconds, or as we're thinking about it, about one millisecond per file. Because the truth is there now exist DBT projects that are operating at a size and scale that were beyond our wildest imaginations when we wrote some of this code a few years ago. So that's looked like improvements for understanding performance, being able to provide really detailed timing information using this parse command and a file that anyone can uh, produce and look at. In 0.19.1, which went out in March, we released a three to four X speed up across the board. If you're still using uh, 0.18, an older version, 0.19.0, I really highly recommend that you upgrade to um, the latest 0.19 patch release. It's just gonna be so much faster. And then in 020, we went at this in a few different angles. We took two pretty big bets. The first was this feature called partial parsing. It's been around for a while, but we reworked it. The second is static analysis and extraction. Pretty exciting stuff. So the good news about partial parsing, so if you run DBT, you edit one model, 
you run dbt again, it's going to be able to parse just that one model. So this is how we're going to get five seconds or fewer in development for projects that used to take eight minutes. And in laboratory conditions, what we've been able to see is a 97% improvement in development time parsing for really big projects. This is how we're going to make dbt scale to some of the largest, most complex organizations and implementations that are out there. We want to give everyone the best possible experience here. That's the good news. With a top to bottom rework, there is always some iterative improvement to follow. So there were a couple of bugs in O20O. Thank you all so much for your patience, your communication, your feedback, and really writing into support if you're using the IDE, writing in, in GitHub issues and on Slack. We're going to iterate on this pretty quickly. So we just put out yesterday, 020.1, the first patch release that fixes a lot of the most common bugs with partial parsing, as well as with some of the other new features in 020. We're going to have another round coming in 020.2. We're just going to keep getting better and better. And, and we're tracking edge cases and limitations that still exist for partial parsing. Reasons that it doesn't work, that you have to do a full reparse. And we're just going to keep improving on this more and more. So really, thank you for working with us as we uh, seek to give everyone the performance that they deserve. The other really exciting thing that shipped in O20O, it's off by default, but you can turn it on with a flag, is this experimental parser, a static analyzer and extractor to read Jinja and SQL code together in a model file, and if possible, pull out just the refs, sources, and configs that dbt needs to know at parse time. So when it works, and that's about 58% of the time, we're able to parse model files three times faster than uh, just plain old ginger rendering. So again, this is off by default for now. We're sampling to validate correctness. We think this is going to be the basis for a lot of really cool stuff to come in the, into the future. But our goal here is to turn on both partial parsing and static extraction by default in all projects and speed up parsing for everyone across the board for dbt 1.0. One, what's that? What's going in? We want dbt to feel really intuitive, really easy to use, really consistent. And that goes for both new users, just learning all the tricks and terminologies right from the start, and more sophisticated, longer term users. We want to make sure that we're communicating to you a degree of stability that uh, feels appropriate for putting dbt right at the heart of the modern data stack. So there are a couple big-ish interface changes that we're thinking about. Some smaller changes, just renaming, rearranging, making things as consistent as possible, and a chance to communicate everything that's going to be stable for all major version one releases, what you can count on, and what kind of communication you can expect from us when and if things are liable to change. I'm going to have more to say about this later this year, specifically in December, specifically at a conference called Coalesce. Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you can register for it. But I want to talk about one of those big-ish interface changes that we're working on right now. To do this, just as Drew queued us up to, I want to talk about DAGs. And I want you to imagine this dbt DAG in particular. You've got a seed file right here uh, in the top left corner. You've got some sources, tests on those sources, models, different layers of models, some snapshots interspersed between those models. Yeah, that's a thing. You need to capture some slowly changing dimensions after doing a little bit of standardizing of that source data. Maybe you want to capture a few final values right at the end of the DAG to have historical comparison, capture outliers, whatever the case may be. This is a kind of setup that we see out in the world. And this is a pretty simple DAG as things go. Feel free to rate it online. I hear there are Twitter accounts for that sort of thing. And yet it's already still really complicated. There's a lot going on here. I want you to imagine how you would go about executing this DAG. Obviously, you would start the way you should always start. DBT seed, so easy to forget, so easy to run into an error because you forgot to seed your seeds before you ran some models that depended on them. Next up, DBT run, DBT snapshot, DBT test. Except the way that we did that, we actually snapshot some things after we ran the models that depended on the snapshot. The tests kind of live in a universe independent from the models that they're actually meant to be testing and, and validating the quality of. 
So we executed that DAG, but we didn't really execute it as a DAG in DAG order, parents, then children, all the way from left to right. If you wanted to do that with existing dbt commands, you'd probably need a lot of extra steps and a lot of extra configuration. Just to run through this really quickly, seed that seed, test that source, run the staging models that build off the seed and source, test those staging models before going any further, snapshot the post-staging snapshots that you've got, maybe with a tag, maybe with some kind of folder structure, not totally sure. Run your intermediate models, test those intermediate models, snapshot your final snapshot. Okay, so you can execute that DAG in eight steps, producing lots of different artifacts along the way. You'd need to figure out a way to merge them later on if you wanna capture all the valuable metadata from this operation. Or, because I think you can tell that there's an or coming on, you can build it in dbt021. That's one step producing one run results.json with all your seeds, your tests, your models, your snapshots. Put simply, this build command is going to seed your seeds, run your models, test your tests, snapshot your snapshots, and do the whole thing in DAG order. This would be, say, in production, a full DAG build, just unqualified dbt build. But you could also build a specific model, which really means run that model and then immediately test it. Make sure that it doesn't just run successfully, but it actually has the data that you want it to. Tests become a lot more important when you're thinking in, in terms of DAGs and in terms of building those DAGs. You could also imagine building everything that's modified in a given pull request, even if it's just that one seed file at the very beginning. We're going to build all the way down the subgraph, including even the snapshot if you want it. So there's ways to exclude it if you don't. Or selection criteria that's exactly as complex as you can manage. I feel like YAML selectors, a feature that came out in 018, one of my personal favorites, are going to be even more powerful when you can build across many different resource types. So in this case, we've got a pretty funny selector. Let's be picky. We only want table models and the tests on them, but only the unique tests. If you list them, this is what you'd get. And if you build them, this is what you'd get. The bigger picture here is that we're building atop the same solid foundations as always. Selection syntax, materialization logic that handles each one of these nodes independently. So. Your snapshot is going to work out, your model is going to work out, your tests are going to work out. But we want you to move up an abstraction. And the build command in this way is opinionated. It wants you to be thinking in terms of unified DAGs, holding tests in really high regard. They should be passing, maybe warning, because a failure is worth stopping for, worth interrupting everything downstream. And build has some pretty compelling opportunity to pair with blue-green deploys and think in terms of building and then deploying an entire DAG, an entire set of dbt resources all at once. It's also going to make the most of metadata by combining all of these different resources together and making sure that they exist in a unified view. Speaking of compelling views of dbt metadata, Bar, I want to hand it over to you. What an introduction. My name is Bar. For those who I haven't met, I'm a product manager here at dbt Labs, and I focus specifically on metadata. And Jeremy talked a little bit about it, but I wanted to start with a first question, which is that metadata is this super buzzword, maybe depending on what circles you're hanging out in. I'd love if someone in the chat could help me define metadata. When you hear metadata, what do you think? There's some fish pun requests. Okay, I'll try to work them in. All right, I'm seeing no guesses about what metadata is, so glad we're talking about it today. Data about data, love it, Julia. That's probably the most common definition that I hear. Something like data about data or context about data. It's the set of information that describes the data. When I hear folks talk about metadata, it's sometimes paired with a bunch of other buzzy words with the promise that metadata can solve all the things, all the hard problems. And that maybe feels exciting 
but also really broad. So when we talk about metadata at DBT Labs, what do we mean? There's a lot that we can do, all the things, but our starting point, the very first focus for the metadata team is to leverage metadata to help DBT project maintainers and sometimes data consumers, people who benefit from, from that project, understand what's happening in DBT projects and how those projects are changing over time. We started talking about metadata all the way back in Coalesce last year, but now we're moving from theoretical conversations and some demos and closed betas into generally available product development and a committed team here. <laughs> Ooh, I'm loving these metadata answers flowing in. Yeah, we put data on top of your data. So this is how we think about it today at DBT Labs. And one of our first steps as a team was to make the metadata that we have more accessible and usable. So as Jericho alluded to, what does that mean? We launched the DBT Cloud Metadata API a few weeks ago. Every time that DBT Cloud runs a project, it generates metadata. And we now serve a GraphQL API that supports arbitrary queries over this data. Now remember, our goal is to leverage metadata to help folks understand what's happening in their DBT projects. So the point of an API here is to allow us as DBT Labs to more easily and quickly build useful performant products on top of our metadata. And we'll talk about some specific examples today. But it's not limited to just us. This API can allow partners to easily integrate with the context about DBT data and can allow customers to as well. And so let's take a look here at an example query for the API just to, to get used to what this API can do. Can anyone write in the chat guessing what a query like this would output? How long a node takes and its test for the most recent run, name execution test of your job's last run. Okay, yeah, we don't need me here. So the answer is exactly that. For the most recent run for this job ID, give me all the models. And then for each model, give me its name, its execution time, and its tests. And then for each test, what actually happened? Did it fail? Did it pass? What happened there? Uh, and you don't have to believe me. I'll quickly share my screen to show you this live. Great, it's showing up. So <laughs> yeah, Julia's cheating. So here, let me run this exact query that we saw in the slides. I set up this like fake job. And so what we see here is exactly what we would expect. We have this model name and we see other model names down here. We have how long it took to execute. And then what are all the tests? And did they pass? Did something else happen? We have all that information right here. Next model, customers. This was the execution time. These were the tests on that model, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is cool. Maybe I don't know what execution time means. So I can actually play around in here. We also have really in-depth documentation on our doc site. I can play around in here and say, you know, what does execution time mean? And I have the definition right here. It's the total time elapsed during the execution of this model. I can see a bunch of other fields that I can select for. So maybe I wanna know if a model was skipped. Let me add that skip Boolean and let me run it again. Okay, I see this model was not skipped. Customers was also not skipped. And so all I wanted to do here was just get our palette sweat playing around with the API a little bit and showing you some of what it can do. Models are not the only thing that the API can query. It can also query sources, tests, exposures, all that good stuff. So I'm gonna go back to the deck. Let's go back and remember how we think about metadata today. We said that we wanna leverage this metadata to help DBT project maintainers and sometimes data consumers understand what's going on in our projects. And so the API helps us do that. The very first use case that we built as DBT Labs on top of this API is a dashboard status tile. We've talked about this concept before, but we've made improvements. And now as of uh, this Monday, it's available for anyone with access to the API to use. This tile, which is exactly what you see here, can be placed on a dashboard or anywhere that you can put an iframe. And it gives insight into the quality, uh, so the DBT tests and the source freshness of the data that feeds into that dashboard. 
I've been working in data for a while. And even so, if I'm looking at a dashboard that I did not build, I usually have no idea whether or not the data I'm looking at is legit. And so this tile helps give DBT users, helps DBT users build trust internally about the data that folks are seeing in their dashboards. It gives me a sanity check that I can trust it, and it can reduce the back and forth between who built the dashboard and me. So here's an example where things are fair. As you can see here, we have a stale source, we have some tests that didn't pass. And when that happens, more granular information and context surfaces. If you click in to see details from the status tile, it takes you to a landing page where you can learn even more about the sources, the models, and tests that feed into the exposure. So let's pull it back for a second into what we just talked about. We'll make this very quick. So I'm going to share again GraphQL just so that it all connects together. So opening the graphical interface here, if I run this exposures query, and just as a reminder, if you aren't familiar with it, exposures let you define and describe a downstream use of your DBT project. So in this case, let's pretend that your exposure is describing a dashboard. So the output here is, hey, what are the parent sources? What are the sources that feed into the dashboard? And what are the models that do? And for those sources, when we checked source freshness, what happened? And for all the tests on those models, did they work? Essentially what, what this API query is getting at is, hey, are the sources in this dashboard fresh? Are the models tested? Is the data I'm looking at legit at all? And so having this API let us build the tile easily to answer those questions. I'm gonna head back to the slide and just talk a little bit about what's next. So we said that we, what we care about is leveraging metadata to help folks understand what's happening in their projects. Today, we're investing in two work streams to make it happen. We have this API out in the wild, but we want to make it even better. We're particularly interested in investing in historical run information, something we don't have today. So that would unlock a bunch of use cases, like you could see how a model performed over time, or you could see what keeps failing, all, all that good stuff. We're also adding a lot more fields into the API so you can get the information you want. So for example, you might care about a PII column tag. We don't have that today. On top of that, we also wanna build new product functionality on top of the API. So we showed you this dashboard status tile, something we're working on right now is visualizing your model bottlenecks and making it really easy to know what models are taking the longest. There's a lot to look forward to here. I'm always happy to chat with anyone about metadata dreams and wishes. And I'm gonna pass it off to Julia to talk about environment variables. Thanks, Bar. I love the audience participation there. I'm Julia Schottenstein, I'm the product manager for the Shipments team. As a reminder, the Shipments team focuses on product and DPT cloud to help you operationalize your DPT deployments with confidence. Our team is focused on delivering great experiences with the scheduler, environments, jobs, CI, CD, Git integrations, and more. We're planning on bringing environment variables to cloud. So I'm excited to share with you all today the basics of environment variables, why you should care, and a few motivating examples on how to use them in your DPT cloud projects. Environment variables are like a more powerful cousin of variables. You can set them in your DBT project, you, project using the Jinja and var function, which takes a key and an optional default value. The environment variable is then interpreted depending on where DBT is run. Environment variables can be used in so many ways, and they give you the power and flexibility to do what you want to do more easily in DBT cloud. There are three levels of environment variables. You can set a project-wide default value, which can be overridden at the environment level, which can in turn be overridden again at the job level or in the IDE for an individual dev. With this level of granular control, you can solution any problem that your team might come up with. Here's a view of how I'll let you set environment variables at the project and environment level. You'll get this neat table where you can define new keys and specify how you want DBT to interpret each variable depending on the environment. We're next going to walk through some motivating examples on how you can use environment variables in DBT projects to hopefully spark your imagination on how you might want to use them. Imagine you want to specify your Snowflake warehouse connection dynamically based on your job workload. Some jobs, like a full refresh, might need the extra large warehouse. 
whereas other jobs, like an incremental job, will be just fine running in a medium warehouse. Simply specify the warehouse name as an environment variable and dynamically set the value at the job level. No more needing to create a separate environment for every warehouse size you need. How about cloning private packages? You can now do this easily by setting your Git token as an environment variable and constructing your repository HTTPS URL properly. Notice we've prefixed this environment variable with a special string, dbtmsecret. Once dbt version 021 comes out later this month, we'll be sure to scrub any environment variables with this special prefix from the logs, and also you won't be able to read its value in plain text after it's been set in cloud. We'll keep cruising through these examples. Many of you have gotten used to using target.name in dbt cloud to create conditional model logic. Instead of using target.name, replace it with an environment variable. In this example, we only want to pull a subset of the data in our development environment, whereas in prod, we'll run the full model. This model will check environment variable called environment to, to determine what to do. Our final example is nothing new, but just a reminder that we have some special environment variables in dbt cloud that will automatically get set at each job run. You can call these special environment variables to get the job ID, run ID, cloud run reason, and more. These environment variables are helpful in auditing your run metadata and can be used for data table organization. We hope that was plenty of motivation and we're excited to hear about all the interesting ways you put environment variables to work in your dbt cloud projects. We'll be onboarding anyone who is interested to the beta program on August 23rd. If you'd like to be involved, give us a shout in the dbt Slack. I know many of you have been itching for private package support in particular, so do not worry, it's not far away now. And before wrapping up, a final word of wisdom. We recommend two or three environments. A small number of environments can really go a long way. Dev, staging, and proj do the trick. If you have some funky use cases, think about building separate jobs and keeping your environment numbers slim. At DVT Labs, we just have dev and prod environments for our internal analytics. We run CI jobs on every pull request to build our models into a temporary schema before we merge new code. If all our tests pass, the code is merged and the models build in prod. And that's all for me. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about what environment variables can do for you. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Drew to take us home. To, to take us home, I'll always think of John Denver. I got a couple slides, but, but really the thing we, we wanna talk about here is, yeah, was, was staging Q3 useful? We love putting on this event every quarter. We've been doing it, I guess this is our, our third iteration of it, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And really this came out of Coalesce and feedback we got last year folks saying that I wanted to hear more from our product team about what we're working on and how we're thinking about uh, DBT and the ecosystem evolving. If you love this, we'd love to hear about that. If there are things you think we can do differently that would make it more impactful and interesting, we'd definitely love to hear about that too. There's a survey that someone can drop in the chat. Would be really grateful if you could take a couple minutes and fill out that survey. At this point, we're going to uh, jump out into the breakout rooms to go a little bit deeper on two different topics. So again, it's DAGs and metadata and lineage. If you got a good DAG pun that you're sitting on, uh, join Bar and I in, in the staging breakout. If you're interested in thinking about workflows and jobs as code and DBT build and, and things of that nature, definitely do join Julia and Jeremy to, to talk about that some, some more too. And really just want to take this last opportunity to, to plug Coalesce one more time. It has been really fun looking at all the, all the submitted talks and, and working with folks and, and putting together a fantastic. So one last time, if you haven't signed up for Coalesce yet, please do that soon <laughs> and we'd love to see you there. So with that, we're going to jump into the breakout rooms. I'll catch you in DAGs and metadata lineage or have a good time talking to Jeremy and Julia too. Thanks everyone.